Welcome back. Well, if the wheels did fall off the world's financial system, then Jeffrey Sachs might say, well, at least the developed countries had wheels to begin with. The poorest nations have neither the system nor the wheels. But Sachs is no pessimist. He's used to fighting. For years, he has been demanding that the developed countries pool their resources to end world poverty within a decade. In recent years, Sachs has been involved in an often fierce battle of ideas with critics of foreign aid, especially fellow economist William Easterly and neoconservative think tanks, who insist most such help is wasted and often does more harm than good. This disagreement over aid is one of the central global debates of our time. In his latest book, Commonwealth, Sachs is again back on the attack. Citing past aid successes, he insists a true global effort to wipe out extreme poverty can work, and most of the development tools are already in place, just waiting for action. In New York, Jeffrey Sachs recently hosted a special State of the Planet conference at his Earth Institute at Columbia University. That's where we had this conversation. Jeffrey Sachs, welcome to our world. Thank you for joining us. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Delighted to be with you. In your book, Commonwealth, you address head-on uh, this, this strange welling up of a lot of criticism and cynicism about the effectiveness of international aid. You take it on from the very start, uh, it's suggesting it's not only completely wrong in many areas, but very harmful. Well, aid, we know, works when it's done well and directed to the right things. If you are practical about aid, specific bed nets for uh, fighting malaria, medicines to keep people alive with AIDS, water holes to help people that uh, have uh, water stress, help for agriculture to grow more food. These practical things have been shown time and again to have fantastic results, and small amounts of money have huge effects. And the naysayers just generalize, of course, if we put money down the drain in Iraq, it's going to show up as wasted aid, but that was knowingly wasted from the start. How could anybody think that that was going to work? But if we fight malaria and measles and AIDS and hunger, there are such proven, known, specific, trackable, monitorable, auditable interventions that have been shown time and again to have huge results. They can't really argue with that. And then people say, we've wasted so much money. Do you know that we've now spent more on the Iraq war than all the world has ever given to all of Africa in all time in aid? In all of history. In fact, in one year, we spend more on the Pentagon, $700 billion, than the whole world's history of aid to Africa in the last half century. Not just U.S. aid, the whole world's aid to all of Africa. So we do very little. Often we do it badly, let's be clear, because you know, if you hand over cash, that's not going to work. Uh, if you uh, uh, give it in a, in a war zone for uh, poor ideas of foreign policy, that's not going to work. But if you focus on things that aid can do in agriculture, in schooling, uh, in uh, education uh, of all sorts, adult education, literacy, of basic infrastructure, these things have been shown time and again to be enormously important for poor people and not as handouts, but to help them get out of the poverty trap. And we can prove that with actual statistics, decline of infant mortality, for instance. So well, take one simple uh, example, so powerful. In Africa, where they say it can't be done, oh, so much corruption and so forth, UNICEF and the government of Norway and others teamed up to take on measles. Measles deaths are down by 91% since the year 2000. And not in one pilot project, not in, quote, well-governed countries across sub-Saharan Africa. Millions of bed nets are being distributed when the International Red Cross and UNICEF have the funding to do it. They're limited not by their capacity to save lives, but by the funds that come to them. In uh, Niger, one of the poorest and toughest places in the world, in one week, two million bed nets were distributed, leading to a tremendous drop of malaria transmission. And if this can be done in one week, and in a couple of days, millions of nets distributed in Kenya, we could actually get malaria under control, essentially bring the deaths down almost to zero at a cost let me put it this way, we need 300 million bed nets. 
They cost $5 each, $1.5 billion. They last five years. That $1.5 billion is less than the U.S. spends in one day on the Pentagon. These figures, these claims can be so easily exploded if you look at it. What's behind, is there an agenda behind the, this pessimism that has welled up in, in well, there, the last decade? There's an ideology behind it. Uh, some people in, in uh, the United States uh, think if you're poor, it's your fault, or they don't want to help, or the free market will solve everything. These are very ideological points. This is not evidence-based. And it's so easy to wave the, 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 uh, the, the red cape and, and get everybody mad. You say, do you know $500 billion has been given to Africa, and where has it gone? And they don't do the most basic arithmetic, for instance, that that's over 60 years for a continent that has now 800 million people. So you divide and you find out, well, that's a few dollars per person. It's about $14 per person on average over this period for all the problems uh, that uh, Africa has. And as I noted, less than one year's Pentagon spending. You suggest that the, the challenges now are so glaring and so urgent in an overcrowded world that there is no way around the world finally facing up to it. But it, and it has to do it in a very coordinated way using a big idea approach that we have in today, that has been missing today. We have drawn lines, uh, uh, at least figuratively, in the sand, and we call them national borders. We say that's what we care about. But people cross those borders, refugees, migrants, legal and illegal, pathogens, in other words, disease agents, cross those borders, uh, whether we like it or not. One person arriving can start an epidemic in another country. And we know how new emerging diseases like AIDS or SARS or other diseases can spread so fast. Climate change and the greenhouse gases, they don't stop at the border. They're circulating in the atmosphere. Uh, the way that food is grown in the rest of the world can affect us. Were antibiotics used to grow that food, creating a worldwide resistance to uh, disease, uh, uh, worldwide pest resistance to those antibiotics, I should say. So many things cross our borders without any restraint that we have to understand if we don't take these issues on together, we can't solve any of them. You point out as well that there, there are many more players involved now that you can really turn in a lot more NGOs, thousands, tens of thousands of NGOs, but also elements even like the super rich that have come on the scene of the world in just the last 20 years with vast sums of money that could also be mobilized. It's not just government anymore. It's many factors. The Forbes uh, magazine puts out its billionaires list every year, and this year's list has about 1,100 billionaires on the planet, more than ever before. Meaning that the net worth of that list this year is about $4.2 trillion for that 1,100. I feel like going on knocking on each door. You know, a few of them have uh, given big. Uh, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, of course. And the fact of the matter is that saving millions of lives, uh, making the planet fit for the future, this is a, a worthy goal uh, and worthy activity for a billionaire. And so I would say to any billionaire, the power that you have with this money to help fix the world is profound right now. Because not only do you have vast sums, but the ability to turn those sums through our advanced technologies into powerful solutions is unprecedented. I, I do think our governments ought to follow through on their responsibilities, but I wouldn't mind if the 1,100 billionaires stepped forward and said, okay, we'll take care of this, because actually they could. Well, Jeffrey Sachs, your book, Commonwealth, is a very challenging book in the very best sense of the word, and as always, your message is one of uh, considerable hope for us all. Thanks very much for joining us. It's been wonderful to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.